About 2,500 years ago, God gave the prophet Daniel a vision of four strange beasts, representing the four world empires which are now history. The Babylonian, Medo-Persian, Grecian, and Roman. Daniel's vision foretold with such astonishing accuracy numerous details of these empires that critics were sure his prophecies must have been written after the events occurred and tried unsuccessfully for years to prove it. The fourth beast alone concerns us. Symbolic of the Roman Empire, it retained characteristics of the three empires that preceded it. Yet it was far more dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured the known world, breaking and trampling all that opposed it. That Rome fulfilled these prophecies and the other details of Daniel's vision is history. Nearly 700 years after Daniel, around 95 AD, the Apostle John was given three further prophetic visions of this terrible fourth beast as recorded in Revelation 12, 13, and 17. At that time, the world empires, represented by the first three beasts, had come and gone exactly as Daniel had prophesied. The fourth beast, the Roman Empire, was then at the height of its power. It too would fall, but unlike its three predecessors, and exactly as the Bible foretold, it would not be conquered by a successor. No fifth world empire would arise to take its place. Instead, scripture prophesied that the Roman Empire itself would be revived in a more powerful form to control all of earth just before Christ's second coming. Numerous scriptures indicate this. The fourth beast's 10 horns represented 10 kings that shall arise. Since 10 kings were never part of the Roman Empire when it existed in the past, we know that fourth empire must be revived worldwide, composed of 10 regions under separate sub-rulers accountable to Antichrist. Only then will the second coming take place with Christ returning to destroy Antichrist and his kingdom and to set up his own millennial reign over the earth from Jerusalem. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 states, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Chapters 12, 13, and 14 of Zechariah prophesy these events quite clearly. So did Daniel. A stone, that is, Christ, was cut out without hands, which smote the image, which became like the shaft of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried it away. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, Christ's kingdom, and filled the whole earth. When will this occur? Verse 44 explains, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. Antichrist's worldwide kingdom, the revived Roman Empire under ten heads, must be established first. Then Christ destroys it and sets up his own kingdom. Interestingly, Today's world has already been divided into ten regions by the Club of Rome, a division which is now followed by mutual agreement in the banking and computer worlds. John saw this fourth beast three times. First, as a red dragon seeking to destroy Israel. And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads, and the great dragon was cast out of heaven, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. In chapter 13, this dreadful beast appears again, 
representing the revived Roman Empire, whose deadly wound was healed, and also its ruler, the Antichrist, whom all that dwell upon the earth shall worship. Notice, the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So the red dragon, who is Satan, is actually building his kingdom and using Antichrist to his own ends. Prophecy, foretelling the future. Assorted psychics claim to do it, but fail miserably. Nor is prophecy found in the Koran, Hindu Vedas, Bhagavad Gita, the sayings of Buddha, Confucius, or Muhammad, the Book of Mormon, or writings of Mary Baker Eddy. The Bible alone reliably foretells the future. About 30% of God's word is prophecy, with hundreds of specific predictions and a record of 100% accuracy. These are not clothed in the ambiguous language of a Nostradamus, but are clear declarations about world-shaking and world-shaping events hundreds and even thousands of years before they became history. For example, that the Jews would be scattered to every corner of this earth, and today you'll find the wandering Jew everywhere, that they would be hated, persecuted, and slaughtered as no other people. The outrage of anti-Semitism is a phenomenon absolutely unique to the Jews, precisely as the Bible foretold. Yet the Bible also prophesied that in spite of being scattered worldwide for 2,500 years since the Babylonian captivity, with every reason to intermarry and change their identity to escape persecution, and in spite of a thousand Hitlers determined to exterminate them, the Jews would be preserved as an identifiable people and brought back to their own land in the last days just before Antichrist would set up his kingdom. And so it happened in 1948. Even more astonishing, the Bible said that Jerusalem would become the key to world peace and a cup of trembling, a millstone around the necks of the nations. And today, exactly as prophesied, Jerusalem is the United Nations' number one problem and the world looks on in fear and trembling, knowing that the next world war could break out at any moment over that tiny city. The undeniable fulfillment of these and scores of other prophecies provides irrefutable evidence that God exists and that the Bible is his revelation to man. Prophecy is likewise unique to Israel's Messiah. There were no prophecies concerning Buddha, Mohammed, Confucius, Zoroaster, Joseph Smith, or any of the founders of the world's religions. Yet there are over 300 prophecies concerning the Jewish Messiah. That he would be born of a virgin in Bethlehem, a descendant of King David, that he would perform miracles, convert the Gentiles, that he would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey and be hailed as the Messiah, and that this would occur on April 6, 32 AD, now celebrated as Palm Sunday. And that four days later, having been betrayed for exactly 30 pieces of silver, he would be crucified, a form of execution unknown at the time of that prophecy in Psalm 22. And that three days later, he would rise from the dead, an astonishing event which separates Christianity from every religion and for which we have irrefutable evidence. These are but a few of the prophecies concerning the Messiah, prophecies which are so numerous and specific, and their fulfillment in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ so indisputable that no one can honestly deny that he is the prophesied Savior of sinners. And the Bible says he's coming back. The 100% fulfillment of biblical prophecies right on schedule assures us that those which are still future will also be fulfilled. The last book in the Bible contains dozens of yet to be fulfilled prophecies recorded in a series of visions given to the Apostle John. There are three visions of the fourth beast that represent Satan, the Antichrist, and the revived Roman Empire he will rule. There's another intriguing figure, however, which is given even more space and prominence than the beast, a mysterious woman. In John's third vision of this scarlet beast with seven heads and ten horns, a woman rides the beast, and not as in a rodeo on a creature which is trying to buck her off, but sitting relaxed and comfortable, obviously a 
key player in the unfolding drama of Antichrist rule over the revived Roman Empire. Who is this woman? John's vision identifies her beyond question. First of all, she's a city, which is built on seven hills. The beast's seven heads are seven mountains, or hills, on which the woman sitteth. Several cities sit on seven hills, but John's vision eliminates all but one. Emblazoned on her forehead are the words, Mystery, Babylon. Saddam Hussein has been rebuilding Iraq's ancient city of Babylon, headquarters of the First World Empire. Could the woman be that city, rebuilt for the Antichrist? But it's the Fourth Empire, headquartered in Rome, which is to be brought back to life, not the Babylonian Empire. And Babylon was not built on seven hills, but Rome was, and has universally been known as the city of seven hills. The Catholic Encyclopedia states, quote, it is within the city of Rome, called the City of Seven Hills, that the entire area of Vatican State proper is now confined. Interestingly, Rome was also known as Babylon. Catholic apologist Carl Keating identifies this woman as Babylon. He writes, Babylon was a code word for Rome. It is used that way six times in the last book of the Bible and in extra biblical works such as sibling oracles, the apocalypse of Baruch, and Estrus. Eusebius Pamphilius, writing about 303, noted that Peter referred to Rome figuratively as Babylon, unquote. Could Rome be the woman on the beast? That would make good sense, because the beast she rides is the revived Roman Empire. This woman is also called the great whore, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. Obviously, Literal whoredom and fornication would be impossible for a city, but spiritual fornication would be possible if the city were a spiritual entity. Jerusalem is such a city. It's called the Holy City and the City of God, having been chosen by God to represent him to the nations. Tragically, Jerusalem violated that relationship and was repeatedly accused by God's prophets of spiritual harlotry and adultery. Isaiah said of Jerusalem, how is the faithful city become a harlot? Jerusalem, however, can't be the woman riding the beast because it wasn't built on seven hills, nor does it meet any of the other criteria in John's vision. There is one other city in the world, and only one, which is a spiritual entity and could therefore commit spiritual fornication with the kings of the earth, and it's built on seven hills. Again, that city is Rome the headquarters of Roman Catholicism, which claims to be the true Christianity. The Pope claims to be the Vicar of Christ. Moreover, the Roman Catholic Church claims that its members have taken the place of Israel as the true people of God, and that Rome is therefore the New Jerusalem. Catholic Rome claims the very titles God gave to Jerusalem, the Holy City, the City of God, and even the Eternal City. Let me pause for a moment to state sincerely that I have no desire to attack Catholics. I'm not a Catholic basher. I love Catholics, and I want them to know the truth. Let's set the record straight. The canons and decrees of the Council of Trent, which Vatican II reconfirmed, contain more than 100 anathemas, damning me and every evangelical Christian for our beliefs and our unwillingness to accept Catholic dogmas and authority. So who is really bashing whom? Let's face the facts honestly from history and the Bible, whatever they may be. We've already discovered from John's vision that these four criteria, being a city known as Babylon, built on seven hills, that committed spiritual fornication with earth's rulers, have ruled out every other city on earth except Rome. We are, of course, not talking about political civil Rome, but about religious Rome, and more specifically the Vatican and the Roman Catholic Church. Its Pope is currently leading the greatest ecumenical movement in history in order to unite all religions under Rome's leadership. In 1986, Pope John Paul II gathered in Assisi, Italy, the leaders of the world's major religions to pray for peace. There were snake worshipers, fire worshipers, spiritists, animists, Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus, North American witch doctors. 
I watched in astonishment as they walked to the microphone to pray. The Pope said they were all praying to the same God and that their prayers were creating a spiritual energy that was bringing about a new climate for peace. John Paul II allowed his good friend the Dalai Lama to put the Buddha on the altar in St. Peter's Church in Assisi and with his monks to have a Buddhist worship ceremony there while Shintoists chanted and rang their bells outside. The prophesied world religion is in the process of being formed before our eyes and the Vatican is the headquarters of the movement. Is this not spiritual fornication? The objection is immediately raised that Vatican City is only a small part of Rome and is not itself built on seven hills. Historically, however, the popes ruled as kings over all of Rome and the surrounding area, as well as over large territories across Italy known as the Papal States. Pope Innocent III abolished the Roman Senate and placed the administration of Rome directly under his control. It wasn't until 1870 that Rome and the other Vatican-controlled territories were finally captured by the army of the newly united Italy. The Jews were liberated at last from Rome's shameful ghetto, and Pope Pius IX took refuge in Vatican City, which has been the headquarters of the Roman Catholic Church ever since. Today, the Vatican owns about one-third of Rome, and its influence is everywhere through its churches and other institutions scattered throughout the entire city of Seven Hills. That church proudly identifies itself as the Roman Catholic Church. A recent article in the National Catholic Reporter titled, Rome, where the pontiff is supreme, declared, quote, no city comes close to being so suffused with religious culture as Rome is with Catholicism. What has emerged over the centuries is unmistakably a culture of the papacy, unquote. The article goes on to refer to the monuments to Roman Catholicism found everywhere in Rome and states, quote, all roads lead, sooner or later, down the Via della Conciliazione to the Vatican. Rome is the world's spiritual crossroads, unquote. Our Sunday Visitor's Catholic Encyclopedia adds, quote, Hence, one understands the central place of Rome in the life of the church today and the significance of the title Roman Catholic Church. Since the founding of the church there, Rome has been the center of all Christendom." Unquote. This is the one city in the world built on seven hills and known as Babylon, which is undoubtedly a spiritual entity. Has spiritual Rome violated its claimed relationship with Christ? and thus been guilty of spiritual fornication? Christ said that his kingdom is not of this world and his servants are not to fight. In direct disobedience, the popes, who included some of the greatest military leaders in history, fought with armies and navies in the name of Christ to build a huge kingdom, an unrivaled worldwide empire of property, wealth, and political influence, which is very much of this world and they have repeatedly engaged in partnership and thus spiritual fornication with emperors, kings, and princes. Claiming to be the bride of Christ, the Roman Catholic Church has been in bed with godless rulers down through history. In more recent times, there were even alliances with Mussolini and Hitler. The Vatican literally put Mussolini into power. Pope Pius XI and his cardinals Praise Mussolini as a man chosen by God and forbade Roman Catholics to oppose him politically. In turn, Mussolini signed the Concordat with the Vatican in 1929, making Roman Catholicism the sole religion of Italy. The Vatican received 750 million lira in cash and 1 billion in state bonds. Four years later, in 1933, came a similar concordat with Hitler, resulting in the Vatican's reception of hundreds of millions of German marks from the Nazi regime all through World War II. One could not ask for clear examples of fornication with the kings of the earth. Similar concordats with many other governments have made the Roman Catholic Church the only religion allowed in those countries and have brought persecution and death upon thousands of evangelicals. Christ never joined forces with Caesar, nor did Peter or Paul, but the Roman Catholic Church has continually engaged in adulterous relationships with secular rulers right up to the present. The alliance between Reagan and Pope John Paul II, between the CIA and the alleged Vicar of Christ, could only be called spiritual fornication. It violated everything Christ taught about his church, 
not being of this world. Former Secretary of State Alexander Haig acknowledged that, quote, the Vatican's information was absolutely better and quicker than ours in every respect, unquote. Vatican liaison to the White House, Archbishop Pio Laghi, kept reminding American officials, quote, listen to the Holy Father. We have 2,000 years experience in this, unquote. 2,000 years of political intrigue at which the Vatican is clearly the master. Mihail Gorbachev has called the Pope, quote, the highest spiritual authority on earth, unquote. Gorbachev summed up the earthly power of the Roman Catholic Church when he declared, quote, Pope John Paul II played a major political role in the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe. The events in Eastern Europe might not have been possible without the presence of this Pope, without the great role which he knew how to play on the world scene, unquote. Such praise could never have been directed at Christ or his apostles, who were martyred by the secular world, which the popes have embraced in spiritual fornication and have even dominated. Papal worldly power has been wielded for centuries in fulfillment of another part of John's remarkable vision. Quote, the woman which thou sawest is a city which rules over the kings of the earth. In John's day, it was the Rome of the Caesars that ruled the world. After the Caesars lost their power, the popes ruled in their place and over wider territories and often more ruthlessly. Pope Gregory XI's the, the papal bull of 1372 in Cona Domini claimed papal dominion over the entire Christian world, secular and religious, and excommunicated all who failed to obey the popes and to pay them taxes. That bull was confirmed by subsequent popes, and in 1568, Pope Pius V swore that it was to remain an eternal law. Pope Alexander VI drew a north-south line down the global map of that day, and in the name of the Christ, who possessed nothing on this earth but his robe, he gave Africa, India, and Asia to Portugal, and the newly discovered North and South America to Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain on the condition that the native inhabitants of those lands must be made to join the Roman Catholic Church and pay taxes to the popes. Rome's dominance in Latin America remains to this day. Nor is empire building an abandoned feature of the past. The Second Vatican Council in Lumen Gentium on November 21, 1964 declared that, quote, the Catholic Church ceaselessly and efficaciously seeks for the return of all humanity and all its goods under Christ, meaning, of course, under the Pope, Christ's alleged vicar. Pope Alexander II decreed that Harold, the lawful king of England, was a usurper, excommunicated him and his followers, and gave the throne to William, Duke of Normandy. Thus, with the Pope's blessing, William the Conqueror killed Harold in battle, took over England, and was crowned in London on Christmas Day in 1066. He accepted the crown of England, quote, in the name of the Holy See of Rome, unquote. As the Pope's agent, William the Conqueror, now their king, was required to teach the English people, quote, due obedience to Christ's vicar, unquote, and to pay their taxes to the Pope punctually. Pope Gregory VII's claim to be king of kings was no idle boast. In 1077, Gregory forbade Henry IV, heir of Charlemagne and supreme head of the Holy Roman Empire, to rule the kingdoms of Italy and Germany and threatened to excommunicate anyone who would serve him as king. In fear for his life, Henry journeyed across the Alps in winter to beg the Pope's forgiveness. The humbled emperor had to spend three days in penitence, barefoot, and in a haircloth shirt outside the Pope's castle at Canossa before he was granted an audience to express his repentance. In 1155, Pope Adrian IV gave the crown of Ireland to the King of England, consigning the Irish to the merciless cruelties of Henry II. A, a later King of England, John Lackland, tried to break free from Rome, and Pope Innocent III forced him to surrender his crown, thereafter allowing him to rule only as a vassal of the Holy See. One 18th century Catholic historian counted 95 popes who claimed to have divine power to depose kings and emperors. Historian R.W. Southern declared, quote, 
During the whole medieval period, there was in Rome a single spiritual and temporal authority exercising powers which in the end exceeded those that had ever lain within the grasp of a Roman emperor." Unquote. Hundreds of other examples could be given. There can be no doubt at all about Catholic Rome's identity as the city known as Babylon, built on seven hills, which committed spiritual fornication with the kings of the earth, and which reigned over the kings of the earth. No other city even comes close to her in this regard. Not only is Babylon the code name for Rome, but Rome's connections to Babylon go much deeper. Ancient Babylon was built around the ruins of the Tower of Babel, from which its name was derived. That tower, designed to reach heaven, was the headquarters of the first world religion, just as Rome will be for the coming world religion of Antichrist. Furthermore, just as Babel's tower and city united church and state, so the popes wielded both civil and religious authority. And in like manner, the woman and the beast she rides will unite the coming world government and world religion. With its attempt to reach heaven by steps of its own making, Babel, Babylon, was the ultimate works religion. And so it has always been in Roman Catholicism. Salvation is unquestionably by works. Vatican II declares, quote, to gain indulgences, the work prescribed must be done. From the most ancient times in the church, good works were also offered to God for the salvation of sinners. All men attained to salvation through faith, baptism, and the observance of the commandments, unquote. Clearly, good works play a key role in earning salvation in Catholicism, as the average Catholic would testify. The Council of Trent, as reproposed by Vatican II, declared, quote, If anyone says that the sacraments of the new law are not necessary for salvation, and that without them men obtain from God through faith alone the grace of justification, let him be anathema, unquote. Thus, by its practice of salvation through good works and ritual, Catholic Rome fits the description of the woman whose name is Babylon. John tells us that the name Babylon, emblazoned on the woman's forehead, is preceded by the word mystery. And again, mystery is the very heart of Roman Catholicism. Pope Paul VI encyclical on the Eucharist is titled Mysterium Fide. Vatican II refers repeatedly to, quote, the mystery of the Eucharist, unquote. The Vatican's new universal catechism declares that all of the church's liturgy is mystery and that its aim is to initiate souls into the mystery of Christ. It is mystagogy, unquote. By claiming to be the custodian of a mystery, which only its priests and bishops can mediate, the Roman Catholic Church keeps its members dependent upon it rather than upon Christ for their salvation. John notes that the woman on the beast is clothed in purple and scarlet. Once again, the very colors of the Roman Caesars and also of the Roman Catholic hierarchy. The Catholic Encyclopedia declares, uh, quote, cassock, also called soutane, the close-fitting ankle-length robe worn by the Catholic clergy as their official garb. The color for bishops and other prelates is purple, for cardinals, scarlet, unquote. The woman riding the beast has a golden cup in her hand. And here again, the golden chalice used in the Eucharist or Mass is the holiest instrument in Roman Catholicism. John perceives that the golden cup is filled with, quote, the filthiness of her abominations, unquote. Could that be the Bible's view of the sacrifice of the Mass, which is the very heart of Roman Catholicism? Such was the conviction of hundreds of thousands of Christians throughout history who were burned at the stake for refusing to participate in the sacrifice of the Mass, which they earnestly believed was the greatest abomination conceivable. Why? Because it claims to be the literal sacrificial offering again and again of the body and blood of Christ, whereas the Bible clearly says that Christ's sacrifice upon the cross was completed once and for all never to be repeated again. Catholicism claims that when, at the Last Supper, Christ said, this is my body and this is my blood, he had to be taken literally. 
the bread and wine he held in his hands had, with those words, become his literal body and blood. And when the priest speaks those words today, the bread and wine become again Christ's literal body and blood to be sacrificed endlessly on Catholic altars as truly as Christ was sacrificed on the cross. Yet no one takes it literally when Christ said, I'm the door, I'm the light of the world, I'm the good shepherd, or when he called his disciples sheep. Christ was obviously, as on other occasions, speaking figuratively when he referred to bread and wine as his body and blood. There's no way that the bread could literally be his body when he was sitting there in his physical body holding it. Much less can millions of tiny wafers each be simultaneously Christ's literal body, soul, personality, divinity, whole and entire, as Catholicism claims. That is not literalism, but mysticism, the mystery emblazoned on the woman's forehead. There's another grave error involved. Vatican II declares, quote, Our Savior at the Last Supper instituted the Eucharistic sacrifice of his body and blood, unquote. The Council of Trent agrees that Christ at the Last Supper, quote, offered up to God the Father his own body and blood under the form of bread and wine, unquote. If so, then he was sacrificed for the sins of the world at the Last Supper before he went to the cross, which is rank heresy. Indeed, he wouldn't have to go to the cross at all if Catholic priests, as they claim, could truly turn bread and wine into the literal body and blood of Christ and offer it as a propitiatory sacrifice on their altars. The Pocket Catholic Dictionary states, quote, The Mass is a truly propitiatory sacrifice, unquote, by which, quote, the Lord is appeased, he grants grace, and he pardons wrongdoings and sins, even grave ones, unquote. The Council of Trent declared, quote, regarding the great mystery of the Eucharist, it is the true and only sacrifice, unquote. Then the cross isn't needed. Of course, Catholicism teaches that the cross is essential, yet it reduces the cross to the same level as the Mass, declaring that Christ's sacrifice upon the cross is only effective in its repetition in the Mass, and then only partially each time the Mass is repeated. It takes many repetitions of the Mass to take a soul to heaven. Indeed, the Pope himself can't tell how many Masses may be needed. As the Pocket Catholic Dictionary explains, finally, the Mass is the divinely ordained means of applying the merits of Calvary. Christ won for the world all the graces it needs for salvation and sanctification, but these blessings are conferred gradually and continually since Calvary and mainly through the Mass. The priest is indispensable since he alone by his powers can change the elements of bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. The more often the sacrifice is offered, the more benefit is conferred." End of quote. In other words, Christ's sacrifice is not yet complete, but is still in process through the Mass. Vatican II says, quote, For in the sacrifice of the Mass, our Lord is immolated. The Mass is a sacrifice in which the sacrifice of the cross is perpetuated. The Pocket Catholic Dictionary explains that in the Mass, Christ, quote, offers himself as really as he did on Calvary, unquote. Then what did Christ mean when he cried in triumph? It is finished. In contrast to the Old Testament sacrifices, which, like the Mass, had to be repeated daily and thus could never take away sin, the Bible declares, but this man, Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. For by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Therefore, there is no more offering for sin. There's a vast difference between the Christ of the Bible and the Christ of Catholicism, who is still being sacrificed and suffering perpetually. Trying to soften this error, Vatican II explains that in the Mass, quote, I'm quoting now, Christ perpetuates in an unbloody manner the sacrifice offered on the cross, unquote. But the Bible plainly declares, quote, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So an unbloody sacrifice, 
without real suffering on the part of Christ can't take away sin, which the Mass purports to do. Catholicism explains that Christ is not really being sacrificed over and over, but his sacrifice on the cross is being, quote, represented, unquote, or made present. Such a statement is meaningless. An event that was completed in the past can't be made present. Moreover, if the past event accomplished its purpose, then there's no reason for wanting to perpetuate it in the present, even if that could be done. For example, if a benefactor pays a creditor the debt someone owes, the debt is gone forever. It would be meaningless to speak of representing or reenacting or perpetuating the payment in the present. That debt has been paid by a transaction that was effected and completed in the past. One could well remember with gratitude the payment that was made, but no reenactment would have any virtue since there no longer remains any debt to be paid. So it is with Christ's payment for our sins upon the cross. As he died, he said, it is finished, using a Greek expression which meant that the debt had been paid in full. Yet the New Catechism of the Catholic Church says, as sacrifice, the Eucharist is also offered in reparation for the sins of the living and the dead and to obtain spiritual or temporal benefits from God." Unquote. That's like trying to pay more installments of a debt that's been paid in full. Clearly, the Mass is a denial of the sufficiency of the payment of Christ made for our sins upon the cross. The Roman Catholic Church claims to be in the process of procuring through its rituals what the Bible says Christ has already accomplished. Vatican II, page one says, for it is the liturgy through which, especially in the divine sacrifice of the Eucharist, the work of our redemption is accomplished." Unquote. But the Bible says redemption has already been accomplished. Hebrews 9.12 assures us that, quote, by his own blood, Christ obtained eternal redemption for us, unquote. Ephesians 1.7 and Colossians 1.14 both state, in whom Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, unquote. In order to carry on the work of redemption, the Catholic priesthood claims to perform the miracle of transubstantiation, turning bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ, quote, as they say, under the appearance of remaining bread and wine, unquote. This is supposed to be a great miracle, even though the wafer and wine remain unchanged in physical appearance and taste, yet there's no such miracle in the Bible. Did Christ ever give a, give a blind man his sight, quote, under the appearance of the man remaining blind, unquote? Did he ever raise a dead man to life under the appearance of the man remaining dead? Under those circumstances, it would not be unbelief, but common sense to deny that the miracle, the alleged miracle, had occurred at all. Suppose the water turned to wine by Christ at the wedding of Cana had been this kind of a, quote, miracle, unquote. The servants pour it out in the, to the governor of the feast, and he exclaims, I asked for wine. This is water. The servants insist, sir, it is wine. Angrily, the governor shouts, it looks like water, tastes like water. It is water. You need faith, the servants insist. This is a miracle. Christ turned water into wine, but under the appearance of remaining water. That's not a miracle, that's a fraud, would be the governor's response, and he would be right. And so it is with transubstantiation. The dogma of purgatory is another abomination. Vatican II says that although Christ suffered to bear our eternal punishment, we must personally suffer to expiate the temporal punishment due for our sins. Quote, sins must be expiated through the sorrows, miseries, and trials of this life, or in the next life through fire and torments or purifying punishments. In purgatory, the souls of those who died in the charity of God and truly repentant for their sins and omissions are cleansed after death with punishments designed to purge away their debt, unquote. Yet Peter himself declared that Christ has, quote, once suffered for sins, he the just for us the unjust, that he might bring us to God, not to purgatory. 
There's a further contradiction. Although Catholicism says we must personally suffer, it also says we don't have to. Masses and rosaries can be said, even after one's death, to reduce one's suffering in purgatory. For those who die wearing the brown scapular of Our Lady of Mount Carmel and fulfill certain other obligations, she will go into purgatory the Saturday after their death and take them out to heaven. So they don't have to personally suffer. Christ's sacrifice on the cross was not sufficient, but its alleged repetition in the Mass, if done enough times, will eventually get one to heaven. Moreover, good Catholics may offer their sufferings to release souls from purgatory. Padre Pio manifested the stigmata for 40 years to pay the penalty for the sins of the world so that souls could be released from purgatory. Of such alleged saints, Vatican II says, quote, they have carried their crosses to make expiation for their own sins and the sins of others. They were convinced that by their suffering, they could help their brothers to obtain salvation from God." Unquote. Again, we see the denial of the sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. For centuries, the payment of money brought deliverance from purgatory. That practice eventually troubled Martin Luther's conscience and sparked the Reformation. Who can forget the infamous sales pitch of the Dominican friar Tetzel, commissioned by Pope Leo X to reap a fortune for Rome? Quote, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs, unquote. This was nothing new. Rome had consistently sold salvation for centuries. Popes published lists of every crime from incest to piracy to murder with a price for which the church would give absolution for each. For example, a, a deacon guilty of murder could be absolved for 20 crowns. The anointed malefactors, as they were called, once pardoned by the church, could not be prosecuted by civil authorities because the church reigned supreme. Here's a further abomination filling the woman's cup, selling tickets to heaven, which actually send people to hell. Similar practices continue in Roman Catholicism to this day. This is a mass card obtainable from any mortuary. Fill in your name and the name of the deceased, and in exchange for an offering, the priest will place the card on the altar when he says mass, allegedly reducing the time of suffering for the deceased in purgatory. Of course, the church makes no guarantee how much the suffering will be shortened, nor how many more masses must be said before the gates of heaven can be opened. Consequently, Multiple masses are purchased, hoping that eventually there will be enough. A friend's father died recently, and he told me that $2,000 in mass cards were purchased at the funeral. Now, some Catholics claim they don't believe in indulgences, but Vatican II declares the church teaches and commands that the usage of indulgences, a usage most beneficial to Christians, and approved by the authority of the sacred councils should be kept in the church. And it condemns with anathema those who say that indulgences are useless or that the church does not have the power to grant them. There are 20 complex rules governing indulgences. Rule 17 explains that the use of a crucifix, rosary, scapular, or medal, quote, can gain a partial indulgence. But if this object of piety is blessed by the pope or any bishop, the faithful who use it with devotion can also gain a plenary, that is a, a full indulgence, on the feast of the apostles Peter and Paul. Here is another abomination filling that gold chalice. What kind of God grants favors depending upon whether a priest or a bishop has blessed some scapular or medal, and whether it is used on a feast of Peter or Paul, and favors, remember, which the sufferings of Christ upon the cross could not procure? Speaking of abominations, the woman is called the mother of harlots. As well as spiritual harlots, Roman Catholicism has created literal harlots by the millions. Supposedly celibate priests, bishops, cardinals, and popes without number throughout history have had their lovers. There were popes who were the sons of supposedly celibate popes. Pope Silverius was fathered by Pope Hormistus. 
and John the 11th by Sergius the Third. The list of bastards who ruled the church includes Popes Boniface the First, Gelasius, Agapetus, Theodore, Adrian the Fourth, and others. No wonder Pope Pius II, who himself fathered illegitimate children, said that Rome was, quote, the only city run by bastards. For centuries, it was a favorite joke that Rome had more prostitutes than any other city because she had the most celibates. The sexual exploits of supposedly celibate priests and nuns, once hushed up, are increasingly coming out in the open. The Archbishop of Vienna recently stepped down after being charged with sexual abuse of minors. The Bishop of Basel, Switzerland, too, resigned after admitting to an affair with a woman whom he made pregnant. The resignation of Ireland's Prime Minister and collapse of its government was recently precipitated by exposure of 40 years of the Catholic Church and Catholic government officials covering up the continued sexual abuse of a pedophile priest. Homosexual priests are dying of AIDS worldwide, with estimates that as many as 70% of priests in some seminaries are practicing homosexuals. The Roman Catholic Church in America has paid out an estimated $1 billion in the past few years in out-of-court settlements to cover up its clergy's sexual abuse. The Franciscan Seminary in Santa Barbara, California, recently had to shut down because of the sexual involvement of its priests. The Milwaukee Archdiocese is in serious financial trouble due to payments it has had to make for out-of-court settlements involving its priests' sexual affairs. The Archdiocese of Santa Fe, New Mexico is on the brink of bankruptcy because of the lawsuits against it for priestly sexual abuse and the fact that Lloyds of London and other insurance companies refused to pay the malpractice insurance because the Archdiocese attempted to cover up the affairs. I have a file nearly two inches thick of news articles involving sexual immorality of Roman Catholic clergy just within the past two years. It's not that Catholic priests and nuns are any more lustful than the average person. They may have started out with higher ideals, but they have had imposed upon them the unbiblical rule of celibacy, which becomes a burden too great to bear. The woman, too, is drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. For centuries, to disobey the popes was heresy punishable by death. J. H. Ignace von Dollinger, a leading 19th century Catholic professor of church history, confessed, quote, Since 1183, the view of the church had been that every departure from its teaching must be punished with death and the most cruel of deaths by fire, unquote. For a thousand years before the Reformation, there were Christians who refused to give allegiance to Rome and who were slaughtered by the millions. Everyone knows of the Crusades to retake the Holy Land, but few know that even larger and more numerous Crusades were fought to exterminate Christians all over Europe, who out of conscience to God and obedience to the Bible would not submit to the authority of the popes or embrace Rome's heresies. Of these martyrs, historian Will Durant wrote, quote, the Roman Church, they were sure, was the whore of Babylon." Unquote. Such was the opinion of the Reformers, written into the Reformation creeds. One could hardly come to any other conclusion from John's vision, yet that opinion is being abandoned by evangelicals in the interests of ecumenism. The popes promised instant entrance to heaven for those who died in this slaughter of the heretics. It took about a century to exterminate the Albigensian Christians who at one time were the majority of the population of southern France. Among the cities wiped out by Pope Innocent III was Béziers, France. 60,000 massacred there, including women and children. In the infamous St. Bartholomew's Massacre in August 1572, 70,000 Huguenots were killed. Another 200,000 slaughtered over a period of months, causing 500,000 to flee to Protestant countries for refuge. The Valdenses were all but exterminated, as were the Hussites. Here's part of Pope Martin V's letter commanding the King of Poland in 1429, that's a hundred years before the Reformation, to exterminate the Hussites. Quote, Know that the interests of the Holy See and those of your crown make it a duty to exterminate the Hussites. Remember that these impious persons dare proclaim principles of equality, 
that all Christians are brethren, that Christ came on earth to abolish slavery. They call the people to liberty. While there is still time then, turn your forces against Bohemia. Burn, massacre, make deserts everywhere, for nothing could be more agreeable to God or more useful to the cause of kings than the extermination of the Hussites." Unquote. We haven't time to mention the horror of the tortures and murders of the Inquisitions which terrorized Europe for centuries. There is no city on earth which has shed more blood, both of Christians and Jews, than Rome. Pagan Rome threw Christians to the lions and killed them in periodic persecutions during the first three centuries. That was nothing, however, compared to the slaughter of both Christians and Jews by Catholic Rome. Historian Will Durant writes candidly, quote, compared with the persecution of alleged heresy in Europe by the Roman Catholic Church, the persecution of Christians in the first three centuries after Christ by pagan Rome was a mild and humane procedure. Yes, this woman is indeed drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus, and no other city even comes close to Rome in this regard. The fact that a woman rides the beast also points to Roman Catholicism, in which the main figure is a woman, a false, sinless, perpetually virgin and all-powerful Mary, whom Rome has invented and worships. Catholics deny they worship Mary and insist that the devotion and honor they give to her is of a lesser quality than that given to God in Christ, perhaps in theory, but not in practice. There are thousands of large and ornate shrines to Mary around the world, nearly a thousand in France alone, visited by hundreds of millions each year, but scarcely a handful of shrines to Christ, and generally very small with few visitors. Pilgrims to Mary's shrines come to ask for her help and protection, both the new universal catechism of the Catholic Church and Vatican II declare, quote, from the most ancient times, the Blessed Virgin has been honored with the title of Mother of God, to whose protection the faithful fly in all their dangers and needs, unquote. Why fly to her protection when God's protection is available? And if this Catholic Mary can indeed protect all Catholics from all dangers and supply all their needs, then she must be at least as great as God and apparently more sympathetic because at least a hundred times as many prayers are offered to Mary, perhaps even a thousand times, as to God and Christ combined. Yes, prayers to Mary. Not just asking her to pray for us, but asking her to do what she would have to be God to do. Even asking her to provide the salvation and forgiveness of sins that Christ has already provided and offers freely in grace. In his prayer for the Marian year, Pope John Paul II asked Mary to comfort, guide, strengthen, and protect, quote, the whole of humanity, unquote. To do so, she would have to be all-powerful, all-knowing, and everywhere at once. His prayer ends, quote, sustain us, O Virgin Mary, on our journey of faith, and obtain for us the grace of eternal salvation, unquote. But Christ offers salvation freely to all who will believe in him and cries out to mankind, come unto me. The Catholic is taught, however, that the way to Christ is through his mother, whose pleas he can't resist. I would be insulted if friends whom I love, instead of coming directly to me, asked my mother to get for them favors from me. It is Christ, not Mary, who died for our sins. Has he not proved his love? He says, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Whosoever comes to me, I will not turn away. I give my sheep eternal life, and they will never perish. No one can pluck them out of my hand. He that believeth on me has everlasting life. Yet the Catholic looks to Mary. The most recited Catholic prayer, the Rosary, cries out for help to Mary, calling her Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. The Bible says Christ is our life and our hope, and surely God's mercy was extended to mankind before Mary was born, so she could hardly be its mother. 
This Catholic Mary is not the Mary of the Bible, but the woman who rides the beast. Demonic apparitions of this Mary by the thousands are appearing around the world, offering her peace plan for the world, and millions are believing in her instead of in Christ. Antichrist is coming to establish his world government and world religion in partnership with the woman who rides the beast. This city on seven hills, whose code name is Babylon, whose colors are purple and scarlet, who has committed fornication with the kings of the earth and has ruled over them, has a golden cup full of abominations in her hand and is drunk with the blood of the saints. She will play a vital role until God's judgment comes upon her. In the meantime, a voice cries from heaven, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins.